Well, good evening. evening. If you'll turn in your Bibles tonight to 1 Timothy chapter 4. We're all the way there. there. We're just a few books or a few chapters away from finishing the entire New Testament. It's only taken us like 25, 30 years. First Timothy chapter 4. While you're turning there, my, when I was young, my grandparents refused, absolutely refused to own a television. Actually, my grandfather, if he'd come over to our house where we had a television, he would sit as far away from it as he possibly could to not accidentally look into a television. And they were part of the Wesleyan Church. And at this point in time, the Wesleyans believed that television was absolutely sinful. That this technology in and of itself would destroy the soul of a person. Now, I honestly don't believe that there's any technology with and in of itself that is absolutely sinful. I see it as a tool. No different than a kitchen knife in the hand of a great chef will make savory, delicious, and tasty dishes. In the hands of a murderer, it'll make slashes, lacerations, and mutilations to a victim. And this tool of the television has brought great education. It's brought enrichment to many people's lives. And it's been used as a tool to spread the gospel. But on the other side of this coin, it has brought to light many of the greatest fears of my grandparents' beliefs about it. That violence and hedonism and desensitizing the nation is very present today. You know, science has studied television and they've looked at the effects of how TV affects the brain. And they're all pretty much confirmed that when you watch television, your mind goes into a state. It's very relaxed. A state that your brain patterns actually change. It goes into this passive brain pattern. Whereas when you're reading a book, you're very active and your brain is very active. So TV actually moves your brain into this hypnotic, almost transcendental state and it allows things to fall in very easily and quickly. But when you read material, you'll find that your brain is much more active in that you are more critical of the things you read than what you would watch on a screen. Now, there was this time that I was at my grandparents' house. And because they did not have television, I was looking for something to do. And they would always have the newspaper there. And as a young child, pulling up a newspaper, I knew nothing of sports. I really could not care any less about the weather. If it was raining like it's right now, I didn't go out. If the sun was shining like a few minutes ago, I would go out. That's as far as my concept of weather was. But as I'm flipping through this big sheets of newspaper, I come across the funnies. And they're colorful. And they're illustrated. And they're the thing that is most similar to the television that I watched as a child. The funny papers. And I remember I opened up the paper and I was reading the funnies and there was this comic strip called Doonesbury. Do you remember those? And I had no idea what political or social, and that's largely what Doonesbury was. It was a political, social commentary, satire strip. In this particular strip, strip there's a pastor and he's sitting down with this couple 
And it's set up kind of like a counseling session would be. And they're asking questions about doctrine, about what the church teaches, and all these things. And the pastor's answering them. And then at the end, they're like, well, I don't know. And the husband of the couple is like, ooh, they have racquetball. And they're like, maybe. So let's go to chapter 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith. Now, he's mentioning some will depart from the faith. These are not non-believers. These are believers. These are people in the church that are going to be departing from the faith. And Paul's stating here that as we move closer and closer to the end of this age, that the church will depart from the gospel. It will depart from discipleship. And it will depart from relationship with Jesus Christ and the body. And Paul continues, By devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons, through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving. For it is made holy by the word of God in prayer. Now Paul's not giving a detailed list of these examples of falling away. He does provide some examples. And he starts off with devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Now Paul and Timothy, they're living in a very polytheistic society. They're living in Rome. Where there's lots of gods everywhere. And really, this phrase that he is mentioning is summing up all the common practices that the Greeks and the Romans and all these people that were in Rome at that time, their practices of worship. Now, we've said many times that the gods of the Old Testament and of the Greeks and the Romans, they always represented something, like mammon, was similar to a god of money. It was always to appeal to this god to gain something. Generally, things like prosperity, power, wealth. And these are the things that our people are going to start seeking after. And these teachings of what the Greeks and the Romans taught about their gods, they really my, mirror if you go down to your Barnes & Noble and go to the self-help section, they're going to teach you things about power and prosperity and success and all of these things that these old Roman and Greek gods all represented. The methods may have changed, but the goal is quite the same. Now I have to think, as I grew up in the 90s, that the church really spent much of its ministries to things like how to manage your money, how to rear your children. These were two common, common themes that you would hear on Christian radio every single day. And also how to be successful. Today the church has taken a further step because the church today spends a lot of time on politics, on mental health, and social issues of the time. Now, after mentioning these very broad terms that Paul puts out, these things of Roman and Greek society, he brings out a couple specific points. Forbidding marriage. 
Now, for Paul to make this prophecy at this point in time, even in Rome, this idea of forbidding marriage would seem very odd. And in our culture, I don't think the church is quite yet to this point of forbidding marriage. And although in the past there have been groups that have promoted this idea of forbidding marriage, but they pretty much go as you would guess. They last for about a generation without children to take up after that. They don't last very long. Yet I do think that the church is doing a very poor job today of supporting marriage. We're not forbidding it so much in the sense of we're preaching against it. However, we're not doing much to support it in a biblical sense. And as a society, marriage in America is on the decline. And the desire to even get married, married in America is at a super low point. Now, I can't say that this is due to the teachings of the church, but I would say that it's probably more than likely to the lack of teaching within the church. In verse 3, he brings out requiring abstinence from foods. Now, this is something that I think the church is really on the bandwagon of because diet is a huge business within the United States. And many churches have programs for diet and exercise. And what is diet other than requiring the absence or abstinence of specific foods? And then Paul pulls out in verse 2 that through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. Now, our context of our book is that this is a book to pastors, to a pastor specifically. And it is written as a guide to instruct pastors. In our previous chapters, we noted how Paul is encouraging Timothy to very much be self-evaluating at all times. And as pastors and teachers and leaders within the church, we must self-evaluate for insincerity. This word in the Greek is where you get the word hypocrite, and it's what the King James rightfully uses, hypocrite. And Thayer points out that the meaning of this word means an actor, like on a stage. And this is why Paul is so focused on pastors that they live a life that is achieving a level within what we would call abundant life principles before they go out and preach about what we call abundant life principles. As pastors, we have to be disciplined, disciplined before we can disciple. We have to learn and earn wisdom before we can teach wisdom. It is so good on a summer day to go out or go down to Laura's house and get her grill as hot as Nebuchadnezzar's furnace. And her and Bill always buy these really nice thick cut steaks, ones that I can't afford, but that's why we go over there to eat them. And you drop the steak on top of the sizzling grill, and you hear the pssss. And then you flip it over, pssss. And you smell all these juices just being sealed into the steak. If we teach things before our learning, and we teach things before our earnings, as pastors, this is what happens. We sear our conscience. Just as we sear a steak to hold in all those juices, if we sear our conscience, the lies are seared 
and sealed inside. And it gets to a point that these teachers, they no longer realize that they are teaching lies. They become like a pathological liar that no longer knows if he is lying or telling the truth. It is jumbled within his mind. Verse 6. If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. As the church, the great commission that we get is the clearest view. The way we get the clearest view of the great commission is by reading all the accounts of the great commission put forth by Matthew, Mark, Luke, which is in Acts, and John. And it really comes down to this. We are to preach the gospel to the unsaved. We are to teach and disciple those who are saved. We here, we speak of it just in simple terms as we speak it of terms of spreading eternal life and building an abundant life. We see it as life after death and life after the new birth. The doctrines of the church, very importantly, need to stay in their lane. And this becomes more and more necessary as we get closer to the end of the age. Verse 7, having nothing to do with irreverent silly myths, rather train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come, for eternal life and the abundant life, for life after death and life after the new birth. Now this is what I mean by the church, we need to stay in our lane. It's not that teaching a biblical approach to business, to management, to finances, to politics, to reading, rearing children, to managing money, or even having a church gym with racquetball is bad. But all this we have to see as silly myths. You know, the teachings of Dr. Spock, Sigmund Freud, and even Albert Einstein have all been either refuted, been changed, or replaced today. In another 50 years, they will be new again. They'll be modified, updated, and these old things of the past that science has done such a great deal of will seem like myths. It'll be no different than reading about Jupiter or Zeus. They will seem like myths. The church playing in the field of psychology, of science, philosophy, is only as useful as diet and exercise to the body. You're only improving what is dying. However, the church continues in giving good news to those who don't know it and teaching those who have the new hope how to have rivers of life springing out of them not only will they have eternal life, but in this life, no matter what their circumstances, they will also have the abundant life. Verse 9, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hope set on the living God who is the savior of all people, especially those who believe. Verse 9 was, the saying is trust, trustworthy. In summary, what is this saying? In summary, it's train yourself for godliness. In the light of our teaching of spirit, soul, and body, we train ourselves in godliness is living in the spirit life. And living in the spirit, it patterns the way we think. 
and it animates the body. This is the way man was originally designed. To train your body to do good works is limited. It's temporary. And quite frankly, you're likely to fail. But to be trained in the spirit, we both have rewards now and in the future. Verse 11, command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourselves to public readings of the scripture and exhortation to teaching. Do not neglect the gift which you have, which was given to you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things, immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. Keep in close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by, doing, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. So as pastors, we set examples in speech. This is not just what we say, but how we say it. In our conduct, as James says in James 1.22, be you doers of the word and not hearers only. We set examples of love, and the word that was used here is agape, which we're very familiar of. It speaks of God's love in faith. This is our conviction of the truth and in purity. The word purity means all of one thing. A glass of pure water, you would expect, only has water in the glass, not water in a fly or a water in some dirt. A pure glass of water is all one single thing. And he also said in verse 16, keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. As pastors, we continue to self-evaluate. This is the bulk of Paul's message to Timothy. The devils go after pastors. And our self-life goes after us too. It is easy with the stresses of this world and the pressures that are put on pastors to build big congregations, to allow the church to become a social club where we draw people in with racquetball courts and rec centers. Or even for the church to become a hub of the community where it provides schools and daycares and colleges. These all seem very good on the outside, but these, th these can become the very main focus of the church. And we fail. Because we can have great schools and raise children that don't know God. We can have great daycares and create households that don't know God and don't have them at their head. We can have great colleges, but have it be apart from God. And when we get focused on all these things, we come by this, we come to look very much like this Doonesbury comic strip. Where they sit down and they have this appearance and they put forth and they ask all the right doctrinal questions. And it looks like by appearance that they're asking all the right things. But it comes down to racquetball really driving their decision of where they go to church. Or maybe we come, become like many, not all, but many in the holiness movement. Where we become very concerned about the outward appearance. Like whether we have a television or how long or short our hair is. Or even debate things like how holy or unholy is it whether you wear a tie or not. Both of these things become 
quite frankly, doctrines of demons. They become these things very, very quickly. Because truly, the devil is not an ugly monster. He was a very beautiful being. And the very thing he tries to seduce us with is knowledge, not just of evil, but also the knowledge of good. As far as Doonesbury, I don't believe the illustrator was a believer. And I believe he's very critical of the church as a whole. We could read his comic strip and we could become very offended that he's poking fun of churches and how many people act at churches. Or we could take his criticism and we could self-evaluate. And we might see where his criticism is actually very correct. And it can bring ourselves to question, are we in the truth? Are we fulfilling the Great Commission? And also, very importantly, as in verse 12, is it by example, example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and purity. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Apply these things to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.